longing to see a nation restored. A prophet calls for God's will to be done. For heaven to come to earth. So we're starting a series, just four-week series, um, looking at the prophet Amos. And um, Amos is a, a minor prophet in as much as he's written only nine chapters to us, but he's a prophet that comes to us in a season of change in the nation of Israel, 800 years before Jesus. And the reason why we want to look at this book of Amos today is because um, Amos gives us an insight into the life and the role and the responsibility of a prophet. And I'm always, um, always challenged by the role that the prophet makes or has within Israel because it has echoes that come right through to the responsibilities of the church. See, the role of a prophet is to be able to hear the voice of God and bring the voice of God to the community of people whom God loves, in this case, Israel. Now, of course, it's the church in the world in which we live. And so Amos is a, like I say, a relatively minor prophet, but he has an enormous amount to say. And the good thing about Amos is that we can track his story quite well to help us understand what it is that he's saying and why he's saying what he's saying in God's name to the people around him. So this morning, um, the message that I'm uh, calling is called um, For Three Sins. For Three Sins, because you'll see this repeated use of these three words throughout the first few chapters of the book of Amos. One of the things about uh, being a Christian is that we spend our lives asking God, what is it that he wants in the moment that we're in? And it's called walking with God. It's being close with God. It's being in touch with God. It's the ability to hear God's spirit and to know his leading through prayer and through the reading of his word and through fellowship. And so when we see a prophet's writings, what we're doing is we're reading into a season of time when Israel was being exposed, if you like, by God for what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong. Now, the prophet's responsibility is not always about trying to highlight what you've done wrong, but it calls the nation of Israel to examine itself. And uh, it was the old uh, Greek philosopher Socrates who said this, that the unexamined life is not worth living. And I I take this to heart. I really do. I know it's Greek philosophy, but it very much echoes Scripture, and we'll see that a little bit towards the end of the talk today. But the unexamined life is a life that's not worth living. If we think that life is just filled with earthly pleasures, running from one scenario to another, trying to fill our lives with the next Instagram or Facebook opportunity, then that's pretty much an unexamined life, and maybe the only thing that you're examining is the amount of hits that you get. Then your life is pretty shallow. Well, for the people of God, they needed to examine their life under an understanding, or within an understanding of what God's expectations were for them. And we do that all of the time with regards to all the other things that we're involved with. If you're involved with a sports team, you'll examine your sporting uh, moments in the context of what it is that um, the, the coach expects. If you're working for somebody, you will be examining your life in keeping with what the boss expects. If, you're the, if you are the boss, you'll be examining your life in the context of what the market expects from you, what people expect with regards to your services and your goods. If you're married, you'll be looking for what it is that your spouse expects. You understand what it is that your family expects. And so it goes on. The unexamined life is not worth living because you get off track and you lose perspective on what it is that God wants. So let's introduce ourselves to Amos. Um, Amos grew sycamore figs. Okay, so here's some sycamore figs. They look quite cool, actually. They're different to the ones we have in New Zealand. We're trying to grow figs at the moment. And uh, <clears throat> the birds love it. You know, every time the fig just gets ripe, the birds are in there. And, uh, and they, 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 they enjoy the figs. We never get a chance to. But um, Amos was a, a sheep farmer. And he was a sycamore, sycamore, sycamore fig tree grower. And, uh, 
and that meant that he was a very much subsistence guy. Uh, there was nothing royal about him. He doesn't, didn't come from a priestly line, so he wasn't part of the traditional priests within the, the, uh, the system of worship. The Israelites had that, and the Levites were the defined group. But rather, he was pretty much an average guy working an average job. And he finds himself in a position where he has the burden from God, a burden from God, the calling from God to speak into the nation and to tell them what it is that God is wanting them to know in this season. But the season is really important, isn't it? The season that we're in, or what Israel in, is very important to understand. And so to help us understand the role that Amos has, I need to just go back and put in about 120 years worth of history here so that we can get the context. Otherwise, we end up falling short of what we would need to understand. The nation of Israel was split. Israel, the 12 tribes, was split at this time of Amos's uh, prophets, uh, prof, um, um, his word. And um, it was split 10-2. 10, 10 of the 12 tribes were in this nation called Israel. The other two tribes, being Judah and Benjamin, were in the, the, uh, the area we know as Judah. And so... This was a real, uh, I suppose, a real slight against the people of God because here they were, as a nation, divided. And for a huge amount of Israel's history, Israel as a whole, they were divided, they were split. And I want to explain how that came about because a split just doesn't happen because of geography, but a split happens because of politics, uh, for inc incorrect worship, jealousy, and those different things that are very human. Um, the golden period, the golden period of Israel's nationhood was under the leadership of King David. He was the second king, but he was a great king. And a lot of his writings are recorded for us, his own story in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. These are the stories of the kings, and David is one of the, the premier kings. A lot of his writings are in the book of Psalms. And we find that he was a, a, a king who was a worshiper, a great warrior, a great leader. He got himself into trouble. We won't go there, but he did. He wasn't a perfect king. After his death, his son Solomon becomes king. And Solomon, we know, is associated with, with wisdom, isn't it? Solomon was given an opportunity. What would you prefer, to have wisdom or to have money? And he says, I'll go for wisdom. Well, he did, and God gave him resources and wealth and power alongside wisdom. But one of the things about Solomon is that in his building campaign, where he built temples and gardens and a huge amount of farms, etc., which built upon what King David had already given them, uh, unfortunately, Solomon wasn't a very good people manager. Solomon worked the people of Israel really, really hardly, really hard. He embraced them as slaves. He got them working on their projects. And by the time Solomon reached old age, there was a rebellion stirring amongst the people. The people had had enough of being treated like slaves, even though the nations around them celebrated what it was that Solomon had produced, these beautiful gardens, beautiful palaces, beautiful, and the beautiful temple, of course. So Solomon dies, Rehoboam, his son, steps up to take responsibility, this, this line of succession as we see. And all of a sudden, the, after the moment of his coronation, he's confronted by the people. The people come to him and say, Rehoboam, we celebrate that you are the king, you're the rightful king, uh, but we want to ask you one question. Are you going to work us as hard as your father Solomon did? Are you going to work us as hard as your father Solomon did? A big question for a, for a people group who were worn out from all of these projects. And so Rehoboam took aside his young counselors and uh, went off for a few days and came back. And this is what he told the people. He said, the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord. 
to fulfill the word of the Lord, the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nabat, through Ahijah, the Shilonite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? So this is the family, of course. To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. So, so what happens is there's a rebellion. And the 10 tribes that we now know as Israel, they said basically to Rehoboam, we're not going to work for you. We're going to separate ourselves from you, from Solomon, and from David. Okay, so here we have this split occurring. And so you've got now two, two groups, two distinct groups. You've got King Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, uh, ruling over Judah and Benjamin, which we now know as Judah, okay, because it was the larger tribe. Okay, so this two out of the 12 tribes in the south are now defined as God's people under the leadership and the history of King David. Now, a lot of our own biblical history tracks all the way back to this portion of the kingdom. Our alignment as Christians goes back to Judah and Benjamin. Why? Because we know that Jesus comes from the line of King David. Okay? So we have sympathy with this group of people because they kept true to the original faith, even though, even though they have to own the fact that they treated their people poorly. All right, does this make sense? You with me on this? Okay, and so to the north, the northern kingdoms, you had King Rehoboam, uh, sorry, King Jeroboam, and uh, he was the king of this new nation called Israel. So here we have this split. It was tenuous. It was basically a popular uprising. And because of it being popular, uh, it, was, it was weak. It was centered around this leader, Jeroboam, who was um, a populist. He had got in the face of the young king. He'd seized the opportunity at a moment of political weakness before the new king had really established himself. So, uh, but he also was politically astute. And this is what he did. And this is the significant thing in this whole story. I really want you to lean in here. This is what he did to secure those 10 tribes as a separate nation. And you'll be aghast at what he did. But this is what he did. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem, which was one of the bigger towns, those 10 tribes, in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel, another town. Jeroboam thought to himself, now this is the important thing, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. Popular uprising, you know, let's, let's clear off from Jerusalem. We're going to do our own thing. Leave David, leave Solomon, leave Rehoboam to themselves. We're going to do our own thing. But of course, the tradition of worship was really, really deep. Really deep. And so what, um, what Jeroboam is realizing is that the moment these folks decide to head back to Jerusalem to worship at the Passover and different festivals, their hearts are going to be drawn back to Jerusalem. You see how that happens? That's very human, isn't it? Like, oh gosh, look what we've given away. Look at this beautiful temple that my father and my grandfather helped build. Oh my goodness, it wasn't so bad after all. And so what happens here is Jeroboam realizes that the moment these 10 tribes go back to Jerusalem to worship, then this uh, coup essentially is just going to disappear. And guess what? The coup leader is going to get his head chopped off. He knew that. All right, that's human nature. So here we go. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. And he said to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan, the two cities in that area. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. So 
So Jeroboam set up a whole new cult of, of worship. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month of the festival held in Judah and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made, and at Bethel he also installed priests at the high places he made. On the 15th day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing, so it was just a random day, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. So what he did was he created a scenario where those 10 tribes now were a stench. A stench, a religious worship stench to the noses of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. They realized that they had now sinned by sacrificing to essentially the gods of other nations. So what had happened is Jeroboam had set up a cult of worship, said, don't go to Jerusalem, come here. We'll worship gods that are separate to the ones that, um, that King David established. Remember, and he, he spun the story in a different way that said, when we came out of Egypt, remember there were golden calves along the way, and there were in the story, even though they were the gods of other nations. He says, we'll, we'll set up our own worship practices. I'm going to appoint priests. I'm going to create special dates. And we're going to have a great old time worshiping because we're a new nation and we have new gods. And they became a stench. And this is what divided the nation. Does it all make sense? Why? All because of one person's pride with respect to Rehoboam, who didn't want to take away the load that his father had given him, and then the pride of this guy, uh, Jeroboam. Um, when one thing leads to another, catastrophe is slowly, slowly building, and next thing you know, you have a disaster on your hands. And I've got this little video playing here. It gives you an idea of what a disaster looks like. A disaster can look like order and calm, can look like collective thoughts being well put together, can look like a strategy, but then catastrophe happens. One thing leads to another. And the, the, the end result of this is just goes on and on and on and on, as you can see. Okay? Anybody like a job? Clean. We only trust that the the men in there or the people in there are okay. One simple little accident caused this catastrophe, okay? And what we've got here in the story of the nation of Israel is the pride and arrogance of two men, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, who both stood their ground and said, this is about me, it's about my ego. And on that basis, the nations were split in two and they became a stench to each other. I hope I explained essentially the history of Israel well enough there. But here we see the cataclysmic event that causes a ripple effect that goes right throughout nations and defines a lot of what we know as the Old Testament writings. And so, and so, we come back to Amos. Remember? Amos. A M O S. A mighty old saint. You like that? That's what Amos stands for. A mighty old saint. You like that? That's pretty good, I thought. Amos gets up and he says, This is what the Lord says. For three sins of, Dam for three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent, because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. Now, here's one of the first things that Amos says. And what we've got to note straight off is that Amos is not targeting the people of God. He's not targeting Israel. He's not targeting Judah, okay, the, the two distinct groups. He's targeting the neighbors. And it's all, it's all cool to talk about the neighbors because they're just a bunch of pagans, aren't they? Okay? You can talk anything about the neighbors. And he says, um, the, those from Damascus have threshed Gilead. Okay? And when they talk about threshing, 
Um, if any of you have been to the Middle East any time, you see these threshing boards. If you can imagine a big snowboard or a big wakeboard, all right, and it's towed by a donkey, or equivalent, and underneath it's got pieces of metal or pieces of shell uh, that are very, very sharp. And this is run over the wheat again and again and again, towed by the, by the donkey or the horse or the cow. Okay, and what it does is it threshes the wheat. It breaks off the grain. But these things are really, really sharp. And so what the illustration is here is it's saying that those from Damascus have uh, threshed the nation of Gilead. Okay, so they've treated them really badly. So you can only imagine what would happen to your body if you were under this uh, threshing machine. You'd get ripped up. So this nation has treated the other really, really badly. And so what we find here, we've got this role of uh, sins that Amos is naming. It says here, what is, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent, because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. So they were in the slave tra- into, into slavery, into human trafficking. God doesn't like human trafficking. Okay, and so this is, a, this is again the neighbors. And again, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not relent because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding a treaty of brotherhood. So there must have been a treaty in the process there in place, and they still broke that. And it carries on. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not relent, because he pursued his brother with a sword and slaughtered the woman of the land, because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked. So now Edom is in trouble, another neighbor. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not relent, because he ripped open the pregnant woman of Gilead in order to extend his borders. So you can see how vile and gross and heinous these sins were, okay? And so all the time, Amos, this farmer who grew sycamore figs and tended sheep, is targeting the nations and targeting the leaders who are outside of the boundaries of Israel and Judah, This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Moab, even for I will not relent, because he burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king. So he desecrated the dead, okay? So all the time, these early prophecies are happening into chapter two of this book, and uh, you can imagine that the people of Israel and the people of Judah are going, yeah, check out those ridiculously horrible pagans. You know, they are just godless, evil people. And look at our little prophet, our little prophet Amos there. He's giving them a hard time. You go, Amos. You know, you climb up that sycamore fig tree and you scream it out from the highest place. Hey, we'll come and eat sheep at your place because you're the man. Okay, and so they'd be feeling quite smug, wouldn't they? Because the neighbors have been given a hard time. And there's something about human nature, isn't it? That's always intrigued about what the neighbors are up to. Okay, why do you think that TV program Keeping Up with the Kardashians is so popular? Somehow everybody's intrigued by somebody else's business. Okay, however, Amos is not going to let Judah and Israel off the hook. This is what the Lord says For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees. This is huge. This is huge. This is what defines the people of God. Because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods the ancestors followed, I will send fire on Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. Whoa. Whoa. This is just, a, a, you know, this is like fire is going to come upon this central place of worship, Jerusalem, and it's going to be destroyed. Why? Because the people of God have dismissed the law of God. They're no longer keeping it. So all of a sudden you go from smug to sober. You're like, whoa, okay. Now we're getting serious. This is a little bit closer to home. And this is what I mentioned before about the unexamined life is not worth living. The the responsibility of the nations of the nation of God, in this case the nations of God, was to make sure that they were listening to people around them who were representing and reflecting the priorities and the values of God. Because the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, in this case, regardless of where they were at at that time, their responsibility was to bring heaven to earth. 
They were to be a jewel on the earth, a, a sign and a wonder to the nations of what it can look like for a nation to be blessed under the hand of God in a covenant relationship. That was their responsibility, was to carry the image of God and the blessing of God so others could look upon that nation and say, wow, look at what God does when people walk in obedience to him. They are blessed. But because they have disregarded this responsibility, in this case, chased other gods, there is now no blessing left. And so Amos carries on. It says, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four... Okay, so now we're with Israel. We've moved on from Judah. I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. So, you know, sexual impropriety, you know, it's, it's always been a problem for the human race. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge in the house of their God, and they drink wine taken as fines. Okay, so what Amos has done is he's drawn people in as they've listened to the sins of the neighbors, and then he has pulled out a sword, God's sword, and gone, and you too need to repent. You too are God's people. You need to change. And so when we begin this story looking at Amos, the the big question for us is always how do people people respond to the prophets? How do people feel towards God's prophets when they predict judgment for sin? Because the prophets um, are usually people who have come out of their own environment, like Amos, he would have gone to school with somebody. Amos would have tended his sheep next to somebody who knew him. He would have been married to somebody, so therefore he was somebody's brother-in-law. Somebody's brother. He was a normal person. And this is always the challenge, is that a prophet's never accepted in their hometown. Okay, So when he starts to prophesy and says, we're in trouble, God doesn't like what we're doing, there's a real challenge and it's a real threat because people look around and they go, well, is it really that bad? You see, life has this way of seducing people into comfort, doesn't it? Seducing people into comfort. You get seduced into a rut. The rut is usually look something like this. It's where your, um, your walls get bigger and your view gets longer. That's the perfect place, isn't it? If you can have a house where you've got a great view and big walls, you've got a perfect rut. Because the world is outside of you, not amongst you. And therefore, what goes on outside of the walls doesn't really matter that much. Because as long as you're comfortable, it doesn't really matter if, as this uh, prophet was saying a moment ago, that the innocent are being treated poorly, even to the point of being traded for a pair of sandals. In other words, the value of life is being treated cheaply, and others are suffering, but you're doing okay. That's the rut of comfort. And that's a seduction that the unexamined life will always fall into. New Zealand, fifth wealthiest nation in the world. We are vulnerable to this. The church, the people of God. We can have a vision of ourselves being extenders of the kingdom, or we have a biblical vision that is a nice, safe, theologically safe rut called a, an ark. We can hold on to the image of the church being an ark. Or oh, we're in this wild old times. She's wild out there. Let's just stick to the ark and be safe. God will look after us. And so we can, we can um, impress ourselves with ourselves and convince ourselves we're doing the right thing. But God has always asked the people of God to be concerned for others around them. And, and that sphere of influence is always about the neighborhood, what's going on in the neighborhood. But the prophet always has trouble to define what it is that they're doing and saying because it's sometimes a little bit immeasurable. I want to use the coronavirus as an example of this. So our Prime Minister yesterday gets up and says, we're going to self-isolate every person who's come back from overseas for 14 days. We're going to stop um, um, big groups gathering. And then what will happen is in three or four months' time, we'll measure the effect of that. If the coronavirus is kept at a minimum, the, the Prime Minister is going to go, see, I made the right decision. And we're going to say, well, it might not have happened anyway. And we go, well, we don't know whether that would happen anyway. 
Does it make sense? So we're caught in between. Uh, there was a, a, a church minister from the UK 20 years ago who was ministering down in Taupo, Taupo and he, um, he prophesied that the volcano that is essentially underneath Lake Taupo is going to erupt and cause huge amount of death. And so this all made the papers, and people were like, oh, wow, you know, is this, gonna, is this really going to happen? Should we believe him or should we not believe him? So the media got hold of it, and then after the date passed when he said this would happen by, he said, oh, it's okay, I prayed, that's why it never happened. He's like, okay. And so this is the tension that the prophet has. Okay, but the prophet is unsettling people. And when he's unsettling people, he's challenging their lifestyles, he's challenging their income bases, he's challenging their relationships, he's challenging their political alliances, he's challenging their selfishness, their very core values, which might be one thing to be said, but at another level, it's what's being lived. And that's the challenge. So I wanted to give you an idea today of what sort of feelings people can have towards a prophet by giving you an illustration. Imagine if a prophet was saying to people, you're obsessed with money at the cost of other people. You set up institutions that protect yourselves and laws that protect yourselves and the innocent and the poor struggle as a result of this. And then if the prophet said, hey, listen, um, I'm going, to, I'm going to send the enemies of you, your people, to take out the high towers, the high places, to prove to you that I'm disappointed in the way that you're living your godly lifestyles. The people who are being prophesied against would say, we don't like this guy, do we? Because he's speaking against us. And then all of a sudden, something happens and people wake up and they have to make a decision as to whether they like the prophet, whether the prophet is telling the truth or not. Does this feel real all of a sudden? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying anything retrospectively about the the Twin Towers, I just want to give you an idea of how the people of God felt towards the prophet. See, when the prophet prophesies and predicts, he names things like greed. He names things like political maneuverings. He names things like the oppression of the poor. He names things that says, you have got high towers where you celebrate the things that you value the most. And in this world today, it's money and it's power and it's trade. I will send the enemies of God to take out those high places to prove to you, to prove to you that I am the God who will not tolerate this, the oppression of the poor. Now, the reason why I've put this picture up here today is to take you back 2,800 years to maybe create a little bit of angst in you right now for the purpose of what it is that we're doing over these coming weeks. You see, it wasn't easy being a prophet. You had to identify things, name things, challenge things, rip the rug out from underneath people to ensure that they start living a life which is the examined life. The examined life. And then you've got to ask yourself deep, searching, and serious questions. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. Don't walk away from here saying Craig thinks that the that uh, uh, 9-11 attack was a judgment of, from God. I'm not saying that. I'm not big enough to say that. I don't have the place or position or power or authority to say that. I'm just saying this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. When somebody challenges your lifestyle, your political uh, leanings, the way in which you feel that the world should work in a Western democracy, in capitalism, All of these things can be challenged. All of these things are up for grabs. And when the prophet comes in, he says, guess what? I'm going to pull the rug out from underneath in such a fashion that you're going to fall on your face. And as you collect yourself, as you pick yourself up again, you're going to ask those deep and searching questions, where is God in the midst of this? So back to Amos. Amos is saying to the people of God, 
I brought you up out of Egypt and I led you 40 years in the wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youths. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. Okay, so the Nazarites had a vow not to drink. Okay, so, but they forced them to drink. And the prophets, they told them not to prophesy. He says, you've done all this, and now I'm going to, you're going to punish you. The swift will not escape, the strong will not muster their strength, and the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground, the fleet-footed soldier will not get away, and the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. So Israel is now being told that God's judgment is coming. In the context of Amos, it's some decades away. And that's the challenge for the prophet, is because at the time, everything looks sweet. There's no problem here. There's no bubbling cauldron happening in Lake Taupo. There's nothing here to signal that there's going to be a dramatic shift or a dramatic change. But the prophet is giving people the chance to repent. And as even we, we sung in the song today, God's kindness leads us towards repentance. God always gives time for change. He always allows room for us to maneuver. He always gives us room to stop, to recollect our thoughts, and, and by his grace to change. One of the challenges that we face in our world today, and this is where this is going to hit the ground, is that we live in a democracy, and uh, we can easily believe the myth called the myth of opportunity. The myth of opportunity says that because we've got an education system and a social welfare system, everybody starts on the same, on the same step. Everybody starts on a level playing ground. The fact that the system fails many people, we disregard, particularly if you're like me, white middle class male, had the privilege of um, a, a, supportive, uh, a supportive family and um, good education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very easy just to simply disregard those who have struggled and say that you've missed the boat, it is your own dumb fault that you've ended up in a place where you have. Uh, all I know is that after 56 years of living on this planet, I've run into a whole lot of people who I look at their lives and go, but for the grace of God, there go I. But for the grace of God, there go I. So we have to break this, this self-protecting mechanism that we have going on in our head perpetually, which says when somebody's failing, it's their fault. When somebody's struggling, it's their problem. It must be uh, sin, it must be uh, laziness, must be crime. It's, it's not. The system isn't perfect. And so we've got to be looking as the people of God into our spheres of influence and say, how can we be salt? How can we be light? How can we move in such a way that the kingdom of God is glorified and that in the examination of our own lives under the leading of the prophet and the word, that we actually get to touch and change the lives of other people? Um, <clears throat> Jesus said... Uh, Sorry, Paul said this to the Corinthians. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. That's a, a hard word. That's essentially um, what Socrates said, isn't it? The unexamined life is not worth living. So the role of the prophet is to bring heaven to earth. And the role of the church is to bring heaven to earth. That's why we send missionaries to bring a touch of heaven to earth. That's why we do what we do. Over the last few years, and I'm going to just sort of speak a little bit about what our future looks like as well here, is that we've worked really hard to engage with the local community. Um, we do lunches in schools with a the They have people trucked in, bussed in from all around the Bay of Plenty. And uh, if you're interested in being part of that program, uh, we're just renewing it, and it's, it's exciting about the future. Let us know. Maybe once a month you could turn up to the school and help the kids uh, with their breakfasts. Um, few, two years ago, we were given the opportunity to purchase a piece of land on State Highway 2 uh, to, with the potential of relocating our church. Uh, that wasn't going to be viable, wasn't going to be practical. But we've kept in touch with the folks who offered us that opportunity, and uh, they've gone down this process now of um, putting in... The, an application for a mixed housing unit to go there, which will provide, uh, amongst other things, 
um, some social housing and low-end housing. Why? Because how would you like to be 20 years old again, those of you who aren't 20, with the aspiration of buying your own home? That's pretty challenging, isn't it? And so these folks have come in, and we're working alongside them. I've been meeting with them uh, to try to see how this can be shaped in such a way that it honors God. As Christian people, they uh, are really committed to this. Next to the Gull service station, I've been talking with a group called Vision West, to a Baptist group out of, South, out of West Auckland. And um, <clears throat> they're going to be managing a uh, housing unit there, which is going to be targeting those who are probably at the bottom of the pile. And so they're going to be providing chaplaincy services and wraparound services for the group that are going to end up in, in these little units and to try to help them get a start where they don't have a start. About seven or eight years ago, we helped the local health clinic here, the doctor's surgery opposite the primary school, uh, with a respite centre. They had a building there on 44-gallon <clears throat> drums, which they were wanting to set up as a place for, usually for their komatu and kuia, the older people, to go to and rest after having had an operation in hospital. And uh, we went to them and said, we see this building, it's not going anywhere, what's your, what's your goal? Oh, we want to set it up. And we said, well, we can help you with that. And so we pulled all our tradesmen together, and this, uh, this, this building functions really, really well as a respite centre for people who are really struggling. But in the process of developing a relationship with the whole order, the health clinic there, um, we've been working hard with our, our kaimanga, our food bank, and we work in partnership with them, helping them to meet the needs of some of the families that are really struggling. But the cries, the big cries, have been from the doctors. The doctors who work down there are in this, uh, in this little wee surgery, it's so small, so tiny, they can't get a wheelchair down the hallway. They have nowhere to eat their lunch except the reception room with the patients. They don't have the ability to, to do their work properly. And some of these doctors have been working down there for a decade, committed, totally committed, to meeting the needs of the poorest of the poor. And these, uh, these doctors... Uh, sacrifice an enormous amount at every level. And so we've heard their cries, and in the last couple of months, we've been networking with them, and we've pulled together um, some, some businessmen, some building business owners, who have uh, agreed that we together can build them a whole new medical centre. By networking the resources of our community, uh, we are targeting a whole new medical facility there that will be fit for purpose, at about 250 uh, square metres worth of offices. And why do we want to do this? Because we want to partner with those who are partnering with the poor. These folks have um, the inreach that we don't yet have, but we can serve what God is already doing. And so we meet with these folks, we pray with these folks, we celebrate what God is doing with these folks. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that we're going to break this open over the next couple of months to ensure that in our immediate sphere of influence, the poor are not left in a place where they are struggling uh, socially, financially, health, uh, psychologically, relationally. We can do this. We have the ability to do this. And then our lives become the church that reflects the passion and the aspiration and the goal of what God wants, to bring heaven to earth. We get to partner, we get to celebrate, we get to be part of what God is already doing. And I'm really, really excited about this because to me there's something really, really special about the ability to do mission in your own patch. And we have the ability to do that, to, to lift people up so they don't feel like they are being threshed like wheat on a threshing floor. We've got to break this idea that the myth of opportunity uh, is, sorry, that opportunity creates uh, a level playing field. It doesn't. And we can break the back of that myth by being engaged and getting up close and personal with the people whose lives are going to be changed by what it is that we do. So as I talk about Amos, I don't come to us with problems, but I come to us with a challenge and a partway solution to what it is that we can do for our, our community around us. We want to be the people of God we don't just want to be the ark that celebrates the fact that we're safe. We want to be the people of God, and it means that we move into realms that are a little bit challenging, a little bit unsafe, uh, challenges of culture, challenges of values. But all of these things are well within our grasp. So I invite you to partner 
with what God is doing as we break out into these whole new areas afresh. You okay to do that? We okay to do this? Yeah. yeah. I know Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Good Neighbor over here, Campbell Hill and Christina are keen. I know that uh, Warren, who's got his wife up serving in Ruel in the Philippines, is keen. Ryan's, eh? She has to be isolated now. Yeah, 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 understandably. Uh, Look, I know this is who we are. This is what the people of God are about. So let's stand as I pray. God, I thank you for um, your word that inspires us to live a life beyond ourselves. Oh God, forgive us for the rut, the rut that seduces, the rut that just woos us, calls us, celebrates us, builds those big fences and celebrates a good view. For all of us, Lord, we, we, we are easily seduced by this. But God, in these next few weeks, as we see the prophet's call to the nation of Israel, let us be reminded of your call to us, your call to us to celebrate being the people of God in the midst of others, actively pursuing, actively living, actively dreaming and praying into being what it is that you want for our world around us. Oh God, this is new, this is exciting, but it's something that we want to be part of because it reflects your word reflects your goals and your values. And so, Father, as we leave today, may we go away with a sense in which this, yes, this unexamined life is not worth living, but we want to examine it. We want to look at ourselves. We want to challenge ourselves and be part of something that is part of your kingdom solution that brings heaven to earth. And all the people said, amen, amen.